So dividing 50 millisieverts by 10.5 years suggests that the dose rate for most of the workers was probably below 5 millisieverts per year, which is just one-fourth of the maximum annual dose for Fukushimans. To get a sense of the distribution of the radiation effect over the 15-country cohort, the authors eliminated each country from the study one at a time to see if eliminating one country's data eliminated the indicated radiation effect. In each sub-analysis, they found that the excess risk ratio, or ERR, was higher than, but compatible with, the National Academy of Sciences BEER-7 risk model, which was the risk model we previously reviewed. So the indicated radiation effect was not biased by data from any particular country. The authors of the study noted that worker smoking is a possible confounding factor, since lung cancer was common among the workers. However, other smoking-associated cancers showed little relation to radiation dose, and the authors concluded that even if smoking played a role, it cannot fully account for the dose relation of cancer to radiation. So let's recap. The 15-country study, authored by 51 radiation scientists, is the largest study ever conducted of nuclear workers. It found increased cancer risk among the workers. The average worker dose was 2 millisieverts per year. Most workers received under 5 millisieverts per year. And the maximum dose allowed in Japan is 20 millisieverts per year. That's 10 times higher than the average annual worker dose and four times higher than most worker doses. Two years later, in 2009, Jacob and colleagues analyzed the 15-country study we just reviewed, plus eight other nuclear worker studies. What makes nuclear worker exposure especially relevant to areas contaminated by nuclear fallout is that both exposure scenarios deliver doses at a slow, persistent rate. And the meta-analysis of Jacob and colleagues suggests that such slow dose rates might be more harmful than fast dose rates. For example, this chart from Jacob et al. shows excess cancer mortality risk found in nine studies of nuclear workers. Each study is denoted by a red dot whose rightward displacement from zero risk along the bottom axis denotes the degree of increased risk found in that study. In contrast, the blue dots represent the comparative excess risk among the atom bomb survivor cohort, adjusted to match the sex ratio and average age of the nuclear workers in each study. As we can see, the red dots are usually more rightward displaced than the blue dots, and therefore most nuclear worker studies found a higher risk of cancer mortality than among atom bomb survivors. This is a significant finding because radiation risk models are largely founded upon fast dose exposures, like from the atomic bomb blasts, and it has been assumed that fast dose rates were more harmful. However, the findings of Jacob and colleagues brings this view into question. As an editorial on the findings of Jacob et al. in the journal Occupation and Environmental Medicine observed, quote, a number of recent studies challenge the assumption that low dose rate exposures to penetrating forms of ionizing radiation are less effective at causing cancer than high dose rate exposures because risk estimates for people who received low dose rate exposures tend to be larger than or similar to the corresponding estimates derived from the study of Japanese atomic bomb survivors. End of quote. 
This graph from Jacob et al. demonstrates the discrepancy of risk models. The two leading risk models are on the left. The second is the National Academy of Sciences cancer risk model we examined previously. Both risk models are based largely on the fast dose rate exposure experienced by atomic bomb survivors. But the third bar on the right represents the higher level of risk derived from the slow dose rate experienced by nuclear workers. So the cutting edge of meta-analytical research suggests that the leading contemporary radiation risk models may actually underestimate the carcinogenic efficiency of low-dose radiation. Science is not only further clarifying the harmful effects of low-dose radiation on large-scale macroscopic levels, but on the microscopic level as well. Recent research has increased the fidelity of data in the low-dose range regarding radiation-induced genetic damage. Chromosomal translocations are a form of genetic damage resulting from the faulty repair of DNA molecules damaged by genotoxic chemicals or radiation. Chromosomal translocations, also known as chromosomal aberrations, are believed to result in many forms of cancer and an increased frequency of chromosomal aberrations is recognized as an indication of an increased risk of cancer. As such, radiation-induced chromosomal aberrations are fundamental to the causal mechanism of radiation-induced cancer. It has been well documented that medium to high dose radiation increases chromosomal aberrations but the influence of low-dose radiation has been less certain. But if this mechanism of radiation-induced cancer occurs at low doses, there would be little reason to doubt that low-dose radiation can cause cancer. In 2010, Bhatti and colleagues published a meta-analysis of studies that examined the influence of medical X-ray examinations on the incidence of chromosomal translocations. They sought to gain greater precision on the impact of low-dose radiation by pooling data from multiple studies. Not only did they find a dose response in the low-dose range, but to their surprise, the frequency of chromosomal aberrations per unit of radiation increased below approximately 20 millisieverts. Moreover, at doses below approximately 10 millisieverts, the frequency of aberrations per unit of radiation increased further still, and by an order of magnitude. Given these findings, evidence for the carcinogenicity of radiation at low doses could hardly be more logically indicated. Let's examine this formally. The hypothetical syllogism is a two-premise argument schema of classical logic of the form. Given that, if it's the case that P, then Q, and if it's the case that Q, then R, then we may conclude that it's also the case that if P, then R. Plugging the scientific evidence we've just reviewed into the hypothetical syllogism, we may reason as follows. Given that, if there's low-dose radiation, then there's more chromosomal harm and if there's more chromosomal harm then there's more cancer then we may conclude that if there's low-dose radiation then there's more cancer to some degree this syllogism may be an oversimplification however our inputs in this valid argument schema are the outputs of state-of-the-art biological research In this video, we've reviewed both established radiobiology and recent radiobiological research. From this broad scientific base, we've observed that the National Academy of Sciences predicts increased cancer risk from exposures below 20 millisieverts per year. 
Research published since the Academy's last report in 2006 corroborates that prediction. Recent research also suggests that the Academy's risk model may underestimate cancer risk. Recent research also finds that radiation exposures below 20 millisieverts are associated with genetic damage. Therefore, both historical and cutting-edge scientific research consistently demonstrate that Japan's allowance of 20 millisieverts per year is not safe. Well, I'd like to thank Ian Goddard for that excellent analysis and kind of sum up what all this means. According to the National Academy of Sciences, the Beer Report, Biological Effect of Ionizing Radiation, the chance of someone in Fukushima receiving a cancer is about 1 in 500 at the threshold that the Japanese have set. But it's worse than that. Young girls are five times more radiosensitive than, than the data indicates. So what that means is that at least one in a hundred young girls is likely to get cancer if they go back in under those radiation limits. And that doesn't include hot particles and it doesn't include what Mr. Goddard has clearly shown is a problem of low-level exposures perhaps being worse than linear. Well, thank you very much and I'll keep you informed.